When I was a kid, I lived in Alabama, way out in the country. My best friend at the time lived about a mile away, and my older brother and I would go over there daily during the summer. Near his property is a dead forest. All the trees are there, but they never have any leaves. It's pretty darn creepy to begin with. Sometimes we played in there, but we never went very far. One day, my brother and my friend, let's call him Sam, wandered off while I was messing with a turtle, and they disappeared. Once I was done playing with the turtle, not hurting it or anything, I went around the property looking for them, until I thought I saw one of them head into the woods. By this time, it was late afternoon and getting darker. I ran to the woods, but I couldn't see them. Then I heard what sounded like them talking, deeper in. I followed the voices, and they kept seeming farther and farther away, as though I should have been getting closer. And then, they stopped. And suddenly, I felt really scared. At that moment, I realized that the sun had already set, and it was starting to get very dark. So I ran all the way back to Sam's house. My older brother and Sam were playing Nintendo in his room and thought that I was still in the backyard playing with the turtle. I never did figure out what I was chasing in those creepy woods, but I'm kind of glad that I never did. Back in May of 2012, my family and I went to Ireland. We were staying in a cottage in a rural area that was far away from any major city or town. Two days before we were leaving, my cousin and I and her two-year-old daughter, Maisie, were outside in the garden. Maisie had one of those interactive books for young kids that play nursery rhymes, row your boat, hickory dickory, things like that, whenever you pressed a certain button. She was messing around, pressing multiple buttons, when she pressed a green one that was supposed to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, but it didn't. Instead, the book played a song that neither I nor her mother recognized. Even weirder, however, was the fact that Maisie began to sing one line toward the end of the song, which I remember being something like, I will reach the golden city to join the angel band. Her mother, of course, was shocked, as she was only two years old and was just beginning to talk. These words were extremely advanced for her vocabulary, even if she had only learned from memory. When I got home, I searched the lyrics Maisie had sung, and it turned out to be what I had speculated, a hymn, specifically one called The Pilgrim's Journey. None of our family was religious, and neither of us understood where Maisie had learnt the hymn, and even less why the book had played it in the first place. We tried pressing the green button again and again, but it never played the hymn again, just Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, as it was supposed to. My nephew, who was two and a half at the time, sister and her husband used to live in my house. One day, my nephew was looking out the window and sharing his juice with the window. His mom asked him what he was doing and he said something about sharing his juice with the man. My sister assumed he was sharing with his reflection and didn't know the word for boy, so she brushed it off. He then began to show off his dino slippers. No big deal. Next day, he's back at it, except this time he says the man had his horses and was scary. She looked out the window, nothing, and no horse-related items in the room at the time. As she's looking, my nephew runs over and begins to cry, saying the man was scary. 
his dad came home later and shot the bad guy away with a Nerf gun, and he never appeared again. This is really weird because both my sister and I, the only two of us who have ever slept in the front end of the house where this happened, used to see this scary looking man out of the other window wearing a cowboy hat. My sister even found a dog tag with info on it about a man. We looked up the information though and found nothing of use. I don't remember anything written on the tag. We live in a fairly big new neighborhood and there were no local deaths. It was really, really odd. For context, I've been doing gymnastics for nine years, and we had some weird shit happen at our old gym. We moved to a new facility in December of 2017, but the creepy stuff didn't end there. Here is one of those stories. This didn't happen to me, but it happened to two of my coaches, who I believe and trust with my life, literally. They wouldn't lie about these things. Gabby and Maya are the only two people who stay in the gym after hours on our practice nights. This particular night was a Thursday. Before this, we had seen handprints all over the mirrors and things like that. The gym we moved into post-handprints was a high school gymnasium, and to exit there are two sets of glass doors with a shoe mat in the space between. They walk a few feet down the hallways of the old school to leave. Maya was in the front and Gabby was behind her. Maya saw a man reflected in the glass. If you think, how could she see that? It's pitch black outside by the time they leave, so reflections really show up in the glass. She says he was white and tall with shaggy dark hair down to his ears. He starts to run toward them. Maya thought maybe he wanted to ask them a question, so she turned around. Gabby ran into her, since Maya is taller and she couldn't see the reflection, but she heard footsteps coming quickly close to them. There was no one there, though. The man was gone, but both of them knew that there had definitely been someone there. This wasn't anything mind-blowing, but it happened to me earlier today, and it made me so confused. I live in an apartment building, and the ground level is like a communal public space. I was taking the lift down from my apartment level to this ground level to exit the place in the morning. The lift doors have transparent panels, so you can look out of the lift. And because of how lifts usually slow down when they're reaching the destination floor, and the doors sometimes take a few seconds to open. I had a good 10 seconds to look at what was happening at the public space in the ground floor. From what I saw, there were three men mopping the floor and one old lady, who I know is my neighbor, was walking across the space in front of these three men. But when I was in the lift, I noticed that all four of them were frozen, but it was weird because they weren't just standing in casual positions. The men looked like they had just frozen as they were mopping, and the old lady was literally mid-stride. I spent a good three or four seconds wondering what was going on as I waited for the lift doors to open. But the moment the lift doors opened and I stepped out, everyone started moving. The men went back to mopping the floor, and the lady continued walking again. It was so odd, though, because it literally looked as though somebody had pressed play on them when I stepped out of the lift. It was so weird to me. I have no idea what happened. It was Christmas Eve of 2014 at about 8 o'clock p.m. I was driving to my boss's house to drop off a set of keys when an orange orb flew over my car. 
I immediately pulled over to the side and got out of the car and looked up to see a dozen orange orbs the size of cantaloupes. They were five to ten feet above me. They seemed to have heartbeats and would control their brightness, pulsing. I was trying to see if they were solid, but they weren't, which was odd because they were definitely intelligent. They were completely silent and seemed to have their own personalities. Some stood still, while others whizzed by playfully. When I would stare at one, it would blink, I guess to let me know that it saw me. I wasn't scared. I was actually euphoric and very excited to be a witness to this. They seemed friendly to me. I watched them for about three to five minutes until they slowly flew away and each one disappeared. I was amazed and I even stopped at a church that was close by to ask if anybody had seen these things. They said no. To this day, it was one of the most bizarre and profound experiences of my life. Also, the next day, my eyes were burning red and sore. I later found out that there were many other sightings all over the US on the same night. My cousin, who is 14 years younger than me, was playing in his bedroom at about age two, maybe three. Suddenly, he starts screaming and bolts out of the room into my arms. I asked him what had happened, expecting him to say that he got hurt or something. He's sobbing, saying, scary guy, scary guy. It was the middle of the day, bright and sunny, and his room was on the second floor. So I just thought something startled him and I was going to go show him that everything was okay. I tried coaxing him back to the bedroom, but he wasn't having it. I went and checked the room for myself and there was nothing spooky, no one there. I finally convinced him to come back into the room, but he insisted on being in my arms when he did. When we got to the room, I said, see? nothing to worry about but he pointed to his closet and said scary guy over there so i walked over to the closet and looked nothing so i told him there's nothing here he turns around and looks at the ceiling of the closet and that's when he starts shrieking and climbing up my body trying to get out of my arms and away from the closet i bolted out of that room with him and he calmed down I never did figure out what he saw, but that room always freaked me out from then on until the day that they finally moved. This has been several years back. I had to have been maybe 16 or 17 at the time. It was a Thursday and I was in the pastor's office working on a lesson for one of the classes. The church was a decent size. When you first walk into the foyer, you have stairs up to your right that go down into the basement and stairs in front that bring you to the sanctuary. From the sanctuary, you have a door on the right that leads to a ramp, which brings you to a hallway. That hallway has a ramp that goes into the basement and library. On past the ramp is the nursery, a classroom, and the office on the right. Then on the left is another hallway that leads to the bathrooms, classrooms, and the gym. I'm in the office and I hear a thud coming from the sanctuary. Confused, I look out the window and see no other cars than mine. I figured maybe the pastor walked over to grab something or check on something. I called him and asked him if he was in the church. He explained that he and his wife were in one of the Carolinas. I asked about the deacons, and most were home or out of state. Plus, most will ring the doorbell to warn me that they're there. With the phone call confirming that I should be alone, I go out to check the noise. I get to the ramp that goes to the sanctuary, and I hear footsteps running down the ramp toward me. 
I couldn't see what it was. I could only hear it. I bailed and I shut myself in the office until I felt safe again. One night shift, I was dispatched to the VA clinic. As it turned out, a juvenile was in a psychiatric appointment for hearing voices. The kid reportedly heard a pair of hatchets tell him to cut people. So, of course, the mom brought him to a doctor. During the appointment, the mother grabbed the hatchets from a bag to show the psychiatrist. As soon as she put them in view, the kid grabbed them and ran out of the building and directly into the cemetery across the street. Thankfully, I was not asked to run alongside K-9 to track this kid, but they did find him without any major incidents. I was, however, tasked with bringing the kid to the centers for evaluation, and while he was in the back of my patrol car, we distracted him with questions while another officer very subtly placed the hatchets in my trunk. It was quiet for a while on the way, and all of a sudden the kid said, Sir, you have my hatchets in the trunk, don't you? I can feel them. I didn't verbally respond, but I simply laughed a little. I have never been so freaked out by anything to this day. The centers obviously wouldn't take the hatchets. My sergeant told me not to place them into evidence, and I tried to return them to the mother and she refused to take them. I think we ultimately threw them out, but I don't really know. I just hope they never reunite with that kid ever again. I had to do my practice in my school as a librarian for three months. Every morning, I used to sweep and mop the library floor and then start to arrange the books on the shelves. Then I would key in all of the new book entries on the computer. I had the habit of bringing a bottle of holy water with me, and I would place it on the table where I sit. Since it was the major exam month, the library would be lonely as the students and the teachers would be going back from school to their houses after one paper that day. Only some students and teachers would come to the library to study and borrow books. Most of the time, though, I would be alone in the library, so I would play some music as I arranged the books on the shelves. One day, as I was taking the log books out from the drawer, I accidentally spilled some holy water on the floor. To my shock, that area started to smoke a little. Although it was hard to see with the naked eye, I sensed that something was amiss in the library that day. As soon as I got up, in shock, the media room doorknob behind me started to twist and turn frantically. I stood in my place and looked over the counter to check if someone was there. I saw a shadow at the bottom of the door. I rushed out of the library and walked over to the media room which was just next door to the library, and turned the doorknob slowly. It was locked. No one could have been in there. So whose shadow did I see? Ever since I was 13, in 2008, I have developed an interest in aliens and UFOs. I have grown enough of an interest to actually create a scrapbook of pictures of UFOs, declassified government documents, newspaper clippings, and things like that. All of these things were available from Google. I even recorded my own UFO sightings here and there, but I eventually threw them out because I was worried that I was sticking my nose where it didn't belong. In any case, this is one of my UFO experiences. It was somewhere between 2009 and 2011. I was around 14 to 16. It was around 8 or 9 p.m. 
and I was looking into the sky to see if I might get lucky and find a UFO. I noticed a large triangular shaped silhouette facing west into my backyard. It was huge and it had a red light at the center. Parts of the craft warped into a boomerang shape. One part was invisible at times and the other part wasn't. It was as if it had some invisible shield that was on and then off. It was able to change its shape from a boomerang and then into a triangle and then just disappear. In the past, I've had other UFO experiences, but this one was the most convincing one of my whole life. Does anyone else have any UFO experiences? If you do, I'd love to hear them. I was up north at my uncle's cabin when I saw something really strange. I'm laying in bed at night and it was like one o'clock in the morning, so it was pretty dark outside. We're surrounded by trees everywhere. I'm laying on the bed upstairs and I'm staring outside at the windows which are downstairs because I can see it from where I'm at. The windows are very large. From the far left window, I see this massive bright white orb floating above the deck or porch. It moves back and forth between the one window and the other. I can't fully remember if I saw it pass over or behind one of the blind spots between the windows, but it just kept going back and forth multiple times with some speed. I gaze at the window and watch the orb travel from one side of the window to the other side multiple times. The size of the orb, from what I can remember, would be about the size of a large watermelon. I know that it was not the moon. Even when the porch is wet, the light of the moon doesn't really reflect. It was just my dad, my grandpa, and I there. There's also one other important thing. This place is where my uncle David's ashes are buried. Not my uncle the owner, but my mom's other brother. He's not buried near the porch of the house, though. But I still wonder if it might have been him. My family and I have always been animal lovers. I've never known a time when we didn't have cats or dogs with us, and I feel like they helped raise me. When my father was in college, he adopted two cats named Tigger and Cito. Tigger passed away due to a coyote, and after she passed, Cito was never the same. She was grumpy and preferred to be by herself, but I would annoy her with my love anyway. One night, I was carrying her in a wicker basket with some blankets. I would bring her room to room with me as I cleaned up. I'd been petting her and listening to her purr when she suddenly stopped moving. I was maybe 12 and I remember praying for the first time to bring her back to me. It was awful to bring her out to my mom and tell her she had passed. I had a tradition that whenever a pet died, I would make a concrete headstone with little marbles and their name on it. I had set it on our kitchen counter to dry, and I left it there. The next morning, I checked on it and found a small piece of her fur right in the center. I went around to everyone and asked if they had placed it there, and they all said that they had not. It felt like she was giving me one last piece of her. I kept it in a tiny knick-knack tea kettle. It lives there with a few of her whiskers that I had found weeks after her passing. I feel like she came to give me one last gift. I was around 24 years old at the time of this event. I have always had trouble sleeping and I would sleep during the day most of the time. This particular day, 
I woke up way later than usual. And once I did, I was really confused because it was already dark outside. I started wondering what had happened to my mother because she never takes her keys with her. I'm the one who opens the door for her when she gets back from work at the end of the day, so I wondered why she wasn't home yet. I was about to grab my phone and call her when I realized some of the lights from our hallway were on. For a second, I thought I was dealing with an intruder or something, but I heard my mom's voice right away. How did she get inside? How come I never heard the door? I got up to make sure it was really her, and it was. When I asked her how she had gotten inside, she got really mad at me, asking if I was crazy, and told me that I was the one who had opened the door for her. I asked her how the workday was and went straight back to my room after. I never opened that door. I was sleeping. So who the hell opened it for her? The door was locked from the inside. Yes, I've already considered sleepwalking, but I've never had it, and no one has ever seen me doing it. And I think my mom would have noticed if I was sleepwalking as opposed to just opening the door as usual. To this day, I know that somebody, who apparently looked like me, opened that door, but I never did. I'm a lucid dreamer, and I can control my dreams and my nightmares. But last night, I had a dream that was very different from anything else. I was working on the floor of my factory job and running the forklift, like normal, until out the bay door there were fireworks, it's more like a plume of light and an explosion coming from the other side of the valley. I live in the desert, we don't have valleys where I'm at. We decided to go outside after seeing these lights fly away into the sky to the left of us. Once we get outside of the bay door, the ground is illuminated like a full moon times 10. We were now in the backyard of my childhood house. We look up to the sky trying to find the light source, but it was just a night sky. When we looked to the right, there was a typical looking alien and when it noticed us, it screeched and jumped up toward us but it dissolved into the brightening light. I woke up in a scream and I couldn't sleep until daylight. My cat, who's pretty aware as well, stared at the wall behind me for a good 30 minutes. Now I can dream about scary stuff and when it happens, I can usually alter it. I can always control what I'm dreaming about, but this was different and I haven't dreamed about aliens in over 10 years. What is this supposed to mean? Have they decided to come back? Why me? Every night, I walk down the stairs to the basement and then into my gaming room to unwind with some video games. As I reach the bottom of the stairs, I turn on the light, but I keep it dimmed, just so I can make my way to my room. At about midnight, it's time to go to sleep, so I open the door of my gaming room to find the lights completely turned off. I deliberately keep the switch at halfway, and when I go to the staircase, they're always pulled all the way down. I've always thought that it was my wife who would come downstairs and shut them off. I politely asked her why she would shut the lights off and she replied, I've never gone downstairs to shut the lights off, not even once. For context, I've seen shadowy images run by in the basement. I dismissed it as being fatigue. However, when my niece was just three years old, she said that there was a boy with red eyes on the staircase. We thought it was just her childhood imagination. Then when my son was two to three years old, he ran into my arms after staring at the staircase. I asked him what was wrong. And finally he said, there's spooky with red eyes. Could entities actually physically manipulate the light switch? 
I can't explain what's going on. Over a decade ago, I was traveling on vacation, and I had booked hotels through some page similar to Expedia, but smaller. Anyway, I got to one of the cities that I was visiting, and I walked to where the hotel I booked was supposed to be. It was a construction site. I tried to call the emergency number for the webpage, but no one ever answered. I was really mad, but I figured I would just deal with my refund once I was back home and I looked for a new place to stay. I was in the city for an event, so I knew some other people who were also there. I asked them where they were staying and decided to just get a room there. It was like a Best Western or Holiday Inn, something along those lines. Anyway, I'm checking in and the receptionist tells me I already have a paid booking there in my name. I am 100% sure I did not mix up the addresses. Also, this hotel was a completely different brand or group. I suppose the website could have rebooked me, but they never informed me of it. And the address that they sent me to was nowhere close to the other hotel. There are hundreds of hotels in that city. The chance that I would randomly pick that one were pretty slim. I never did manage to speak to anybody from that webpage, but... It still freaks me out just a little bit. I was sitting downstairs in the kitchen, waiting for water to boil. I was talking to my brother downstairs for a bit, and he told me that he was going to take a shower. Soon after, my brother went upstairs to go shower. I was alone by myself downstairs, sitting on a chair, playing on my phone, and facing myself toward the opened bathroom. My phone was positioned upward near my face. It's not sitting so low near the bottom. About two minutes later, out of the top of my peripheral vision, I saw my brother walking out of the bathroom, wearing clothes that I have seen him own and wear before. The top half of the shirt is white while the bottom half is black. His head was positioned and focused oddly when he was walking out of the bathroom, like straight forward. He wasn't looking at me. I felt kind of startled, so I stood up and called out to him. No one else appeared in the living room. At that moment, I remembered that my brother was upstairs in the other bathroom showering. One thing I remember is that he walked out fast but didn't seem to completely walk all the way out. It was like he was diminished halfway through. That part freaked me out the most. It was my brother that I saw, but something was just not quite right. I've never seen a doppelganger before, and it really freaked me out. This all happened when I was a kid. I was spending the weekend at my mom's house. My parents were separated, and I woke up one morning and watched some cartoons in her room while she slept. Eventually, I turned the TV off and went downstairs to make a bowl of cereal. I sat down at the table, which was about 10 feet from the open basement door. As I was eating, I heard my mom call me very loudly from the basement. The only things down there were a washing and drying machine and a toilet. I walked over to the door and peeked down there, and it was pitch black. That's when I remembered that my mom was asleep upstairs and hadn't come past me at all. So I freaked out, ran upstairs to her room, and sure enough, she was there asleep. There was no way that it could have been her, and it was just us in the house. The apartment gave me off, strange, and creepy vibes. 
My mom and I and a few other people all hated the feeling that you would get in the basement and the back room upstairs would give off very negative energy. Every time you went in there, you would start feeling kind of sad and very alert. She never used that room. It only had a couple of boxes in it for the five or so years that she lived there. Has anyone else had similar experiences? A couple of months ago, while I was sitting in a car wash, my music stopped, which always occurs when a call comes through. I looked at the media system to see who was ringing. It said, ma'am, M-A-M. I went to answer and nobody was there and the call ended. Ma'am isn't really common here, but it is what I called my mom and how she signed off on her birthday cards. She was never ever stored in my phone as ma'am though. It was always under dad and it still is because they only had one landline between them. No missed or received calls on my phone were logged during that time. The thing is, my mom's been dead for a while now. Three years, in fact. I shrugged it off as stress, except yesterday it happened again when I was driving. My husband was in the passenger seat and he saw it with his own eyes. It occurred three times. The first time, the line was open for at least a minute but nobody spoke. The second time, a bit shorter, and the third time, mere seconds. My husband is a complete skeptic, but he can't explain this, and neither can I. I did think maybe it was a spoofed number, but again, there's no record of the calls. It's like they never happened. So for slight context, I'm 22 and as my mom was pregnant with me, my grandfather passed away from lung cancer. The only thing he ever got me was this little clown doll that was supposed to hang over my crib. When you pull down the clown's legs, they stretch out, the whole body does, and it plays the little music box style song as it winds itself back up. The tune slowly stops over the course of about two minutes as the clown slowly goes back up to where it started. Now, I know this already sounds like a cheesy horror story setup, but stick with me. When I was a child, maybe seven or eight years old, I used to have the clown hanging from the metal curtain tiles back in my room, probably because I was too young to have read or watched it. But one night, my mom walked up the stairs and into my room while I was asleep because the clown was playing its song, but it hadn't had its legs pulled down. It apparently played for about five minutes, abruptly stopped and never wound down. I do remember that my mom had recorded it on her old flip phone and showed me in the morning. We found out later in the day that on that night, my great grandma had passed away. So my grandfather's mom. My mom is super adamant that it was her dad sending some sort of signal, but I would be interested to know what you guys think. Reading some posts about glitch in the matrix experiences reminded me of an experience my mom had about 10 years ago. I asked her about it again tonight, and she retold it to me to make sure I had all the right details, so I'm telling the story on her behalf. My mom was driving into the city one day and was stuck in traffic. We live in Ireland. She was looking out the window at the buildings and saw an old woman sitting in a wheelchair in the doorway of one of the buildings. She described this woman as a shawley, which apparently was the name of the women in this part of the city in the 1940s and 50s 
who worked in the marketplace. They were called shawlies because of the black shawls they wore. She remembers the woman looking out onto the road with a solemn expression, and my mom was particularly fascinated by her because it had been so many years since she had seen one of these women. The traffic moved on and she parked in a car park around the corner from the street. About an hour later, she was leaving the city and looked over to the side of the street as she was passing to see if the woman was still there. All of the buildings were run down and boarded up, including the doorway the woman had been standing in. She said that the buildings looked entirely different to how she had seen them just an hour before. My mom has always thought of this as sort of a seeing through the veil type of thing, but could it be a glitch in the matrix after all? Whenever I tell this story, people call me crazy or tell me that my grandparents' house is haunted. But to be honest, this stuff only happens to me and it's only happened three or four times that I can think of. It was a normal day. I was hanging out at home, waiting for my mom to come home on her lunch break. It was about 30 minutes before she got home that I was watching SpongeBob or Hannah Montana that had happened. At the time, it scared the hell out of me, since I knew that I was home alone with all the doors locked. But I felt a hand on my shoulder. Then I smell a smell that I haven't smelled in years, followed by a voice that made all the hairs on my body stand up. It was my great grandma. She said, I'm here, Miha. I'm always here. I love you. As for the smell, it wasn't until a month or so later that I put together what it was. My grandma had wanted to have a vial of my great grandma's old perfume in the home. I smelled that and it reminded me of the smell that I had smelled when I felt the hand. And then I remembered that that was what my great grandma always wore. To this day, everyone brushes this story off or asks me why out of all the family members she would visit me. I don't know. I just know that she did. This story is pretty short, and I have no idea why it happened. But it was pretty late at night, and I wanted to go to sleep. Just right about when I put my head on the pillow and closed my eyes, I immediately had a vision of a gnome, a really short one. In this vision, he stood behind the transparent curtain that was in front of me, since the big window is right at the foot of where I lay. I could clearly see most of his features since the curtain was transparent. He had a huge smile, and he had closed but smiling eyes, bald head, and no beard. His clothes appeared ragged and to be brown and gray in coloring. Right after I had that vision, which didn't seem like my imagination at all, I sat up and I felt really scared. I didn't feel comfortable sleeping near the window. I just couldn't sleep, even though the gnome wasn't there when I opened my eyes. So I went and slept near my sister. Like I said, I don't really know how to explain it. But it wasn't my imagination. It wasn't like when you have a random thought or image in your head that you can easily dismiss. This was like I was watching something happen through my eyes that were closed. Anyway, I would just like to know if anyone else has experienced anything like this related to gnomes. I'm currently seeking some insight into a strange event that happened in my past. I'm hoping for possible explanations related to cryptids or paranormal phenomena so I can understand what happened. This occurred back when I was living in Seymour, Indiana, 
when I was about eight or nine years old. I was spending my day at a playground located near the apartment complex where I lived. In my playtime, I distinctly heard my mom's voice calling out to me from a direction entirely opposite to where she was at the moment. Baffled, I went to confirm that it was her, only to be told that she had not called me. I went back to playing and I didn't hear the voice again. What puzzles me are actually a few aspects of this experience. First, my mom was situated a substantial distance away from me, probably about four or five minutes away. Yet the voice that mimicked hers seemed to come from an identical distance, but in the complete opposite direction. Secondly, I have no prior history of hallucinations in my life. I initially shared this story before, but I got more questions than answers. Hopefully somebody knows what this might be. Skinwalker doesn't seem to fit the description, at least based on what I understand, but some kind of mimicry was at play. Let me start by saying that growing up, my little sister never slept in our room as a child, like ever. Normally she would sleep with my mom due to her freaking out about one thing or another. To be honest, it made me feel a little bit uncomfortable about sleeping in there by myself, which I did every night. Her constant freakouts about it, coupled with the feeling of being watched while I was in there alone, even in the middle of the day, made me feel super uneasy. That being said, there was one night that I came home from hanging out with my boyfriend at the time, and I walked into my room. And who do I see? My little sister. At the time, she was five and I was 15, and she was totally fine and in the top bunk. I was incredibly surprised that my mom got her to sleep in her own bed. She looks down from her bunk and points to my great-grandmother's rocking chair. It was then that I noticed that it was slightly rocking back and forth. She laughed as she pointed and said, look, it's grandma. I immediately yelled for my mom to take her and the rocking chair out of my room. My great grandma had died a few months before and my sister barely knew her. Without pictures, she wouldn't even know what she looked like. It was so creepy. When I was around four years old, I went to my grandparents' house for my very first solo sleepover. I remember playing in their guest room and always having my attention drawn to a specific corner of the room. Anyway, that evening I went to bed soundly. I woke up right around dawn, and I can remember as clear as day seeing a small humanoid figure walking across the windowsill of the window facing east. I remember the dawn light creating a sort of silhouetted image of this thing, but I could tell that it was wearing clothing and from the waist down, it had a sort of transparent look to it. As it neared the end of the windowsill, I can remember it noticing me watching it, and it quickly hopped off the sill into the dark corner of the room that had always seemed to draw my attention. A few years ago, I was visiting my mom and I brought it up. She said that she vividly remembers picking me up that morning, and I was scared out of my wits to the point where I would refuse to ever enter the same room again to gather my toys. I've run this encounter through my head more times than I can count, trying my best to dismiss it as a childhood dream. But 30 years later, that memory sticks out in my mind as clear as day. I'm pretty sure I saw some kind of fey creature. I just don't know what.
This is not my story. I heard it on a very new podcast in Norway, where one of our celebrity mediums interviews the everyman and listens to their stories. This is one of the stories. Some of these experiences are quite remarkable, and I wish more people could hear them all. This happened in northern Norway in the 80s. A man and his brother-in-law used to take a rowboat to go to the grocery store. This was, as I said, in northern Norway in the 80s, not many urban areas. The wives, I think, were in the house on land and waited for them to come back from the sea. Suddenly, they see one of the guys from the boat walking over to the estate, walking toward the house and around a corner. The women were very puzzled by this. Maybe he'd forgotten something. And had he changed clothes? They didn't see the boat. They waited for him to come inside the house, but no one came. A couple of hours later, he and his brother-in-law came home with the groceries. A couple of weeks later, they would go on the same trip to get groceries by boat. This day, the sea was very dangerous, and the boat had tipped over, and they both drowned. And when they died, his wife suddenly remembered that the clothes he wore on that day when he drowned was the same outfit he wore when they saw him walk toward the house that day, two weeks before. I live in the mountains, and my hollow is surrounded by woods. There's a little spot you can walk into in the woods, which is just a giant circle with trees open all around it. My friend and I have gone to picnic there, and this day that we went there, we started hearing this flute. It was really loud, and it was coming from a direction where there were no houses. It sounded like a woodwind of sort, something that sounded very spiritual. All of my neighbors were pretty old, and I can guarantee that none of them spend their time walking in the woods playing a flute. We heard this for hours. We left at about 8 o'clock that night, and when we walked back, you could hear it somewhat across the valley. I didn't hear it again for about two years after that, but one night I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning. My bed was right next to the window, and I had cracked it to let in some fresh air while I slept. I woke up to the sound of the flute, coming right outside my window. I was too worried to look out and see what it was. It went on for about an hour, before it finally stopped playing. And to this day, I have never heard it again. My boyfriend and I stayed at the Hotel Pennsylvania this weekend. It's known for being haunted, and it looks like it fits the part. It's old, and the rooms are run down. When we checked in, we got our keys, and went to our room on the 12th floor. The keys didn't work, so we went down and got new ones. Those didn't work either. A worker there had to let us in, and he said he didn't know why our keys wouldn't work because the key thing on the door was working just fine. Anyway, last night I fell asleep at about one, while my boyfriend stayed up for a little bit. He says that at about two o'clock, I sat up, opened my eyes, and looked like I hadn't been sleeping at all. He said all the hair on my body looked like it stood up. And then I said to him, the door is open, and then fell back down and went to sleep. He said five minutes later, the light on the bedside table next to me turned on by itself. He decided to just ignore the situation and go to bed. He got up early at about 6.15 to go to the gym. On his way, he passed a woman in the hallway that he didn't know. He greeted her, and all she said was, the door is closing now, and continued walking.
I received a call from my brother with no caller ID or phone company record very soon after he died. It sounded like long distance calls used to sound back when we all had landlines, as if he was very distant. At first I was perplexed, but once I said his name, things cleared up a bit and soon after the call ended. I think his energy was just still strong enough that he had the ability to pop in to let me know he was okay. He's visited many times in other ways. The most concrete was a lucid dream in which he revealed that he was not relieved that his long battle with cancer was over. I have a good vocabulary, but he used terminology that I just would not have. It wouldn't have even been in my mind. So I know it wasn't my own mind trying to work through his death. He was more tethered in the time soon after his death. Now he just pays visits now and then, especially when I'm sick. I know it because sometimes I feel his hand on my forehead, something he always liked me to do for him when he was ill. My kids and I have had a lot of experiences, not just with him, but I'll always remember that phone call right after he died. This happened to me many years ago. I was maybe 10. I'm 23 now. My sister and I were over at her friend's house, which she had told us was haunted during prior visits. It was just us. Her mom was at work and her little sister was at daycare. We were down in the basement, which was half finished. It was furnished, but the walls had no siding yet. We were messing around down there, jumping on the couch, just doing kid stuff. We decided we were hungry, so we headed upstairs, shut the basement lights off, and took an immediate right at the top of the stairs into the kitchen. We were in there maybe a few minutes making sandwiches, when all of a sudden we heard the loudest, most blood-curdling scream I've ever heard come from the basement. It was absolutely terrifying. I don't know if three kids have ever gotten out of a house so fast. We sat on the curb across the street until her mom got home. I've had several encounters with what I presume to be the paranormal, but that was by far the most horrifying and memorable. It still gives me the creeps to talk about it, and to this day I'll sometimes text my sister to ask if she remembers it, just to make sure I'm not crazy. In the seventh grade one day, I was talking with some friends and we started telling some scary stories just for fun. One of my friends told a story about how he and a couple of friends went to an abandoned house and one person from the group brought a Ouija board. They got mad at him because he didn't say anything about bringing it to that place. So some people left because, you know, they were smart and they knew that you just didn't mess around with that board. But a handful stayed and decided to move up to the attic and play with the board. While playing with the board, it just flips over by itself and the planchette goes flying. That scared everybody and they all left right away. And while everybody hurried out of the house, the one kid that brought the board decided to hide in a closet, which would obviously stop a demon from attacking you. He called his mother to pick him up but his mom punished him by making him stay overnight in the abandoned house, and in the morning she came to go pick him up. Now this is where it gets interesting. After that incident, the kid was riding his bike, when out of nowhere he falls, and while inspecting his body for injuries, his parents find three big scratches on both the front and the back of his body. Nobody knows what really happened to him, but everyone has their suspicions. Thank you. 
In 2020, I was staying with my sister in her house that she'd had for nine years. I was taking a shower, and when I opened the curtain to get out, I saw the towel on the hook of the door move up and down off of the hook, like it would if you were going to take it off to dry yourself. I was shocked. I had never seen anything like that before. I ran downstairs to my nieces, ages 13 and 14, and they were just laughing. One of the first nights I moved in, I had a dream about me hiding from my sister in a boiler room or basement. I saw that she was burned up like Freddy Krueger. My sister is 40, and I'm almost certain that she practices witchcraft along with our grandmother, in whose home I also experienced weird dreams when I stayed with her a month later. We both stayed in the same room, sleeping, and one night my grandma was in my dream. When I woke up, she did too, just a minute or so later. Hours later, she got on the phone with her friend, and I heard her say, it's crazy where your spirit will travel when you're asleep. She started to talk about the exact same dream I had had. I had never told her about it. When I was in my late teens, early 20s, I was staying at a friend's house. It was a big and old house that didn't give off any weird vibes. That afternoon, I was walking through the living room, which was pitch black, curtains closed and no lights on. I ended up tripping on a vacuum cleaner. I was about to fall when I felt a hand on my chest push me back up. No one was there. I was a little freaked, but brushed it off and went on with my life. I went to bed later and woke up during the night to see a lady sitting at the end of my bed. She was wearing an old looking nurse uniform with a white bandana. She was just watching me. I didn't feel scared or unsafe. It was just a calm feeling. I closed my eyes and when I opened them again, she was gone. That morning, I told my friend and her parents about it. Her mother went to grab a book from the shelf full of old photos. Their house used to be a place where people would come to give birth, like a hospital, but specifically for birthing. While looking through the book, I saw a picture of the midwife that I had seen. It was an odd experience, but not at all creepy. I like to think that she was just making sure I was okay and was keeping me safe. from Virginia, and I currently live on the border of Virginia and West Virginia. My entire life I have experienced the paranormal. From dealing with ghosts and shadow people at a security job, to dealing with an inhuman being at a retail job, I have seen it all. But lately, I am experiencing something new. Being from the mountains, I have been aware of Haines and Bogans and, of course, the Fey Folk. Thankfully, I've never had to deal with the latter, until now. As of late, I have started hearing small sing-song voices crying out, seen flashes of silver, and have noticed small knickknacks and collectibles disappearing and reappearing. I keep a broom at the front and back door. I circle my house with salt, and I use oil on every door frame, and I have a cross or a religious symbol in every room. I have a Judeo-Christian upbringing. Of interest, we literally live right next to a giant sinkhole that my neighbor has heard growling from before. I'm not really looking for advice for getting rid of anything or helping deal with it, since it's not really an issue and we don't necessarily feel threatened. I just thought it might be fun to share my experiences and see if anybody else also has experience with the Fae.
We used to have a mimic when I was in college. People would hear or see me or my husband when we weren't there. After moving to our apartment in another state, we didn't have many experiences and assumed that it had stayed with the house. A couple of months ago, we moved into a different apartment and we've been having some odd occurrences. Things are moved around and reorganized. We hear or see each other when we aren't there stuff we used to see in our old place. The mimic has always been kind of helpful, so we don't really mind having it around. The first weekend in our new place, my shoes were organized without either of us touching them. Stuff I needed has popped up on the counters in plain sight. This morning, I was brushing my teeth as my husband was making coffee, and I heard him say, we're almost out of milk. I assumed he meant creamer since we don't have regular milk in the house and he was making coffee. When I went to make a cup, surely enough, we were almost out of creamer. I went into the home office and asked my husband if he had meant creamer before, when I heard him say we were low on milk, and he just gave me this weird face. He insisted that he never said that. My friendly neighborhood mimic, I guess, just wanted me to be prepared when I was going to make a cup of coffee. Denver welcomed us with crisp air and the promise of a relaxing vacation. The Airbnb we rented looked perfect online, charming, rustic, and just modern enough. It was a two-story house near the heart of the city, its age giving it character that newer places lacked. We arrived in the afternoon, and as I fiddled with the lockbox to retrieve the keys, I noticed the neighbor across the street watching us. An older woman, her eyes were a blend of curiosity and something else. Was it concern? She gave a small nod as our eyes met, then went back inside. The moment I opened the door, a strange feeling washed over me. It's hard to describe, like walking into a room where an argument just happened. You can't see it, but you can feel the tension hanging in the air. But the place looked great. Vintage furniture, a modern kitchen, and just a hint of old house smell that somehow felt comforting. The first sign that something was off came that night. I woke up around 3 a.m., the house wrapped in darkness, and heard footsteps upstairs. The floorboards creaked, methodical and slow, as if someone was walking back and forth. At first, I brushed it off. Old houses make noises, but this was different. The steps had intent. When I went to check, there was no one there, just an empty hallway bathed in the glow of the nightlight I'd plugged in earlier. Sleep eluded me for the rest of the night, but I said nothing to my family the next morning. Why ruin their vacation over what could easily be explained by an overactive imagination? But then, things escalated. The second night, my spouse heard whispering in the kitchen. It was just above a murmur, not loud enough to make out words, but distinct enough to be human speech. When we checked, nothing was out of place. The digital clock on the oven read 3.15 a.m., and the house was once again wrapped in unsettling silence. By the third night, we all felt it, the weight of unseen eyes watching us. It's a hard feeling to shake, that sensation of intrusion in a space that's supposed to be your sanctuary, if only temporarily. We decided to stay up and see if we could catch whatever, or whoever, was responsible for the disturbances. We didn't have to wait long. Just after midnight, the temperature in the room plummeted. The drop was sudden and severe, turning our breath visible. We huddled together, uncertain but resolute. And then we saw it, a shadow darker than the darkness that surrounded it, darting across the wall. This was no trick of the light. 
it moved against the natural direction of the shadows, as if operating on its own volition. And as it moved, a voice followed, more coherent this time, a raspy whisper that said, Get out. That did it. We left, abandoning the Airbnb for the safety of a 24-hour diner while we searched for a hotel. We left a carefully worded review, warning future renters without sounding like alarmists. No vacation is worth whatever that was. Weeks later, I got a message from the neighbor who had watched us arrive and found our review. She wanted to share the house's history. It was old, yes, but it was also the site of a tragedy, a family lost to a fire, the cause of which was never determined. Locals avoided it, she said, as did the renters who came and went, never lasting more than a few nights. We never returned to that house, and if the spirits have their way, we never will. Some places are not meant to be occupied, not by the living anyway. We intruded, and the house itself turned against us, urging us to leave before we became a part of its dark history. And leave we did, grateful but forever changed, a family vacation turned cautionary tale. Gold Coast Encounter by Lena. I've always been a skeptic. Ghost stories and supernatural tales were just that, stories. But my experience on the Gold Coast shook that skepticism to its core. I was vacationing in Surfer's Paradise, drawn by its beautiful beaches and lively atmosphere. I rented a small apartment near the beach, a quaint place that seemed perfect for a relaxing getaway. The first few days were exactly what I expected, sun, surf, and the bustling nightlife. But things changed on the fourth night. I returned to my apartment late after a night out. The place was dark and I was too tired to bother with the lights. So I stumbled into my bed in the dim moonlight. Just as I was about to drift off, I heard a faint whisper. It was so soft that I thought I had imagined it. I brushed it off as the wind or maybe a neighbor, but then it happened again. This time, the whisper was clearer, almost like somebody was in the room with me. I sat up, my heart racing, and scanned the dark room for any sign of an intruder. Nothing. Trying to calm my nerves, I got up to get a glass of water. That's when I saw it a shadowy figure standing in the corner of the room. It was human-shaped, but seemed to be made of darkness, darker than the surrounding shadows. I froze, not sure if I was seeing things or not. The figure didn't move. It just stood there, like it was watching me. I reached for the light switch, my hands trembling. The moment the light flooded the room, the shadow vanished. There was no one there. No way that somebody could have hidden or escaped without me noticing. I didn't sleep much that night, and the next day I asked the landlord if there had been any strange occurrences in the apartment. He seemed uneasy, avoiding my gaze. He mumbled something about previous tenants complaining about weird happenings, but nothing concrete. The following nights were restless. I would wake up to strange noises, whispers, and once, a chillingly cold breeze that seemed to come from nowhere. Each time I turned on the lights, the room was empty, but the feeling of being watched never left. On my last night, things escalated. I woke up to the sensation of somebody pressing down on my chest. I opened my eyes to the horrifying sight of the shadow figure looming over me. Its form was more defined now, almost like a person cloaked in darkness. I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. I just lay there, frozen in terror. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, it vanished. I was left gasping for air, my heart pounding out of my chest. I turned on every light in the apartment and stayed up until dawn. 
I cut my vacation short and left the Gold Coast the next day. I couldn't shake the feeling of that shadowy presence, and even now, back in the safety of my own home. I sometimes catch glimpses of something out of the corner of my eye, or hear a whisper in the quiet of the night. Part of me thinks I'm not rid of that shadow, at least not yet. My creepy night in the black pine forest. All right, so let me tell you about this super weird thing that happened to me and my buddy Alex in the black pine forest. I don't know its real name, but that's what we called it. We're both pretty chill about ghost stories and all, but this experience was next level. We hit up the forest for a weekend hike. It's got these massive pine trees and it's usually a peaceful spot but locals sometimes chat about it being kind of spooky. We didn't pay much attention to those stories. Day one was all hiking, setting up camp and the usual stuff, nothing out of the ordinary. The forest was alive with nature sounds, but when night came, things got super quiet. It was just me, Alex, who knocked out early, and our campfire. I wasn't ready to sleep, so I stepped outside the tent for some air. And then I heard something really strange, like whispers, not the wind or animals, but actual whispering. It was coming from the trees around our camp. I was curious and okay, a bit freaked out, but I had to check it out. I grabbed my flashlight and headed into the trees. The whispers got louder as I got closer. It was like a bunch of people talking all at once, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. It was super eerie. As I moved deeper into the forest, the whispers seemed to surround me. I felt this chill, and not just because it was night. It was like someone or something was watching me. I kept going, thinking maybe I'd find some kids pranking campers or something, but nope, there was nobody there. Then the whispering just stopped, like completely. One second it was there, the next total silence. I stood there, flashlight in hand, feeling my heart racing. I didn't know whether to bolt back to camp or keep looking around. After what felt like ages, I decided to head back. I didn't mention anything to Alex because I didn't want to freak him out, but I barely slept that night, listening for any more whispers, which thankfully didn't come back. The next day we packed up and hiked back. I did a little bit of digging and found out that Black Pine Forest was known for this kind of thing. Stories of unexplained sounds, shadows, and even ghost sightings. I wish I knew that before, but honestly, it probably wouldn't have stopped us. So yeah, that's my creepy story from the woods. No idea what those whispers were, but it's something I'll never forget. My experience at Pine Valley Cabin. Let me share this freaky experience I had in a cabin up in Pine Valley, Utah. My buddy Jack and I decided to take a weekend trip for some hiking and fishing. Jack's uncle had this old cabin up there, said we could use it anytime. The place was pretty rustic, tucked away in the woods, no Wi-Fi, no cell service. <laughs> exactly what we were looking for. So we get there and the cabin is more off the grid than we expected. It's this old creaky wooden structure surrounded by these tall pine trees. It had a real creepy vibe, but we shrugged it off, excited for the weekend ahead. The first day was great, hiking, fishing, the works. But as night fell, things started to get, well, weird. We were sitting by the fire, telling stories and having a few beers when we heard this strange noise. It was like a soft tapping coming from the side of the cabin. We figured it was probably just an animal or the wind. 
Later, when we were bunking down, the tapping started again. This time, it was followed by what sounded like whispering. It was so faint that I thought I was imagining it. I asked Jack if he had heard it, and he just laughed and said I was trying to scare him. I tried to sleep, but the whispering continued, growing louder and then softer. I couldn't make out what was being said. It was like someone was right outside the window. I got up to check, half expecting to see somebody peering in, but there was nothing. Just the dark, quiet woods. The next morning we joked about it, blaming the wind or maybe one too many beers. But inside, I think we both felt a bit uneasy. I don't know about you, but I've never had so many beers that I hallucinated. We spent the day outdoors trying to shake off the weirdness of the night before. The second night, though, was worse. Both of us woke up to the sound of footsteps outside. They were heavy, like someone was pacing back and forth on the porch and was fairly irritated. I remember just feeling frozen, listening to those steps, wondering if we should go out and check. We mustered the courage to look outside, but again, nothing. No footprints, no sign of anyone being there. It was dead quiet, and the feeling of being watched was overwhelming. By morning, we had had enough. There was just something about that cabin, something so unsettling that we just couldn't explain. We packed up and left as soon as the sun came up. On the drive back, we talked about it. Jack admitted that his uncle had mentioned some weird stuff happening at the cabin before, but he never took it too seriously. He thought it was just old family tales and nothing more. I've done some camping and hiking in all kinds of places, but I have never experienced anything like that. There's something about that cabin in Pine Valley. Something, as my grandpa would say, that just don't feel right. Reflection. I've always been fascinated by antiques, so when I found an old or neatly framed mirror in the attic of the cabin I was renovating in rural Maine, it felt like striking gold. The cabin itself was a fixer-upper, inherited from a distant relative. I had planned to turn it into a cozy retreat. The first time I saw it, the mirror seemed normal, albeit a bit dusty. It was only after I cleaned and hung it in my bedroom that things got strange. That night, as I prepared for bed, I glanced in the mirror and froze. There was a shadowy figure standing behind me. It was so distinct, so unnerving. I whirled around, heart pounding. There was nothing there. At first, I dismissed it as a trick of the light or my tired mind playing tricks. However, it happened again the next night, and every night after. Each time I looked in the mirror, the shadowy figure was there, just standing, its features too blurred to make out. I tried moving the mirror to different spots, but it made no difference. The figure was always there, always just a reflection. It never moved, never made a sound, just stood there, watching me. Sleep became elusive. I started researching the cabin's history. It turned out that the cabin had quite a grim past. It was originally owned by a reclusive man, known for his eccentric behavior. Locals whispered about him practicing strange rituals and dabbling in the occult. His sudden disappearance years ago remained a mystery. The more I learned, the more I became convinced that the figure in the mirror was connected to the cabin's former owner. Maybe it was his spirit or something he had summoned. The thought sent shivers down my spine. One night, driven by a mixture of fear and curiosity, I decided to confront it. I stood before the mirror and addressed the figure directly, asking what it wanted and why it was here. There was no response. 
just the silent, eerie stare from the shadow. Frustrated and scared, I covered the mirror with a cloth. That's when things escalated. Strange noises filled the cabin at night. Knocks, whispers, things I couldn't explain. It was as if covering the mirror had angered whatever it was tied to. I had had enough. I couldn't live in fear any longer. I took the mirror out into the woods and buried it, hoping that would end whatever connection it had to the cabin. The next few nights were peaceful. The strange occurrences stopped. But the feeling of being watched, that never really went away. I sold the cabin soon after, unable to shake off the experiences I had had there, no longer desiring to turn it into that cozy retreat. It felt like a lie after what I'd been through. The Message by the Hearth My family's decision to spend our vacation in a quaint old cabin in the Appalachian foothills seemed like the perfect way to disconnect from a crazy world. It was just me, my parents, and my younger brother Lucas. The cabin was rustic and charming, nestled in a secluded spot surrounded by dense woods. Our first evening was spent playing board games and enjoying the warmth of the crackling fireplace. As the clock struck midnight, the room chilled suddenly. That's when we saw her, a ghostly figure of a woman standing by the fireplace. She was ethereal, her form barely more than a wisp of smoke, yet unmistakably human. Each night she returned. She never spoke, only stared into the fire with a wistful, sorrowful expression. Her eyes, full of unspoken stories, seemed to plead for something. My parents were really freaked out, but I felt drawn to her. I wanted to know her story, to understand her silent message, to know what kept her by that fire. I began researching the history of the cabin. The local library held dusty records and old newspaper clippings that told a tale of tragedy. A century ago, the cabin was home to a young woman named Abigail. Her lover, a soldier, had left for war and promised to return. Abigail waited years, but he never came back. Heartbroken, she spent her remaining days in the cabin, always hoping for his return. It seemed clear to me that the ghostly woman was Abigail. Each night, I tried to communicate with her, to let her know that her lover wouldn't return and she should move on. But she only gazed into the fire, lost in her own world. On our last night, I tried something different. I sat by the fireplace, speaking gently about the world outside, how time had moved on. I told her it was okay to let go, that her lover's spirit had probably moved on and was likely waiting for her so she could move on too. As I spoke, a change came over Abigail. She turned to look at me, a faint smile on her lips. For a moment, the room filled with a warm, peaceful light. And then, she faded away, leaving nothing but a feeling of serenity. We left the cabin the next day. I don't know if Abigail found peace or if she simply chose to stop appearing to us. But I like to believe that she moved on, that our presence and understanding helped free her from her century-long wait. The memory of Abigail and her silent, sorrowful watch by the fireplace remains with me, and I think it probably always will. The Night of Knocking Last fall, my friend Hannah and I decided to spend a weekend in a secluded cabin in the Cascades. It was an ideal spot for a beautiful, peaceful getaway. Or so we thought. 
The cabin, nestled in a thickly wooded area, was rustic and charming. The perfect escape from our busy city lives and corporate jobs. Our first day was uneventful, filled with hiking and enjoying the tranquil surroundings. As night fell, we settled in, lighting a fire and sharing stories. And that's when the banging started. It began as a soft thudding on the walls, so faint we thought it might be an animal outside. But as the night progressed, the banging grew louder and more persistent, echoing around the entire cabin. It was as if someone, or something, was circling the cabin, pounding on the walls with relentless intensity. We were terrified, huddling together in the living room. Every time we mustered the courage to peek outside, we saw nothing but the dark, dense forest. And in some ways, that made it all worse. The banging continued, rhythmic and unyielding, creating a symphony of terror that made it impossible to think straight, let alone sleep. We sat wide-eyed and anxious, waiting for dawn. When the first light of morning finally broke, the banging stopped abruptly. We cautiously stepped outside, our nerves on edge. That's when we saw them, footprints encircling the cabin. But these were not ordinary footprints. They were large, misshapen, with too many toes, and they didn't resemble any animal we knew. The sight of those bizarre, unidentifiable tracks sent a new wave of fear through us, because whatever made them, we couldn't see. We packed up quickly, hardly speaking as we hurried to leave the cabin behind. The drive back was silent. I think we were both just trying to make sense of what had just happened to us. We never went back to that cabin. What was lurking in the woods? What was its intention? Maybe some questions are just better left unanswered. The hike that never ended. My encounter on the trails of Mount San Antonio in California, also known as Mount Baldy, still sends shivers down my spine. I've always been an avid hiker, seeking out nature's challenges. Mount Baldy, with its rugged beauty and challenging trails, seemed like the perfect weekend escape. But that weekend turned into a surreal, never-ending loop of confusion and fear. I started my hike early in the morning, the sun just beginning to cast its golden hues over the landscape. The trail was clear, and I was well prepared with supplies and a map. I planned to reach the summit and return before dusk. The ascent was breathtaking, both in its scenic beauty and in its physical demand. I reached the summit by early afternoon, feeling a sense of accomplishment as I took in the panoramic view. After a short rest, I began my descent, expecting it to be straightforward. But as I hiked down, an unsettling fog began to roll in, thick and disorienting. I checked my compass and map frequently, but something seemed off. The trail markers, once clear, now became sporadic and hard to follow. The landscape, so familiar on my ascent, felt strangely different. Hours passed, and I should have been nearing the base, but the trail just kept going. The fog grew denser, and a chilling sense of isolation set in. I tried to retrace my steps, thinking I might have taken a wrong turn, but the path behind me was just as confusing. As night fell, I realized I was lost. The fog was so thick now that my flashlight barely cut through it. I decided to stop and set up a makeshift camp, hoping to wait out the fog until morning. But the strangest part came with the dawn. When the sun rose, the fog lifted, revealing not the familiar trails of Mount Baldy, but an unrecognizable dense forest. I was on a completely different path, one I had no recollection of taking. My map was useless here. 
panicked, I started walking, hoping to find my way out or run into another hiker. But the forest seemed endless, the trees a repeating pattern of eerie similarity. I walked for hours, but it felt like I wasn't making any progress at all. It was as if the forest was reshaping itself around me. Then I heard voices, distant and echoing. They seemed to be calling my name. I followed them thinking that it might be other hikers or a search party looking for me, but the voices led me in circles, always out of reach, their whispers tinged with an unsettling familiarity. By the time I found my way out of the forest, it was night again. I emerged onto a trail that led me back to the base of Mount Baldy. How I got there, or where I had been, I still can't explain. I was found by a park ranger, who told me I had been missing for two days. They'd been searching for me, thinking that I had fallen or injured myself. The experience on Mount Baldy has left me bewildered and deeply unsettled. I've hiked those trails before and since, and nothing like that has ever happened again. I can't explain the shifting landscape, the endless forest, or the voices that seem to echo out of nowhere. The hike on Mount Baldy was more than just a physical journey. It was a brush with something I have no way of understanding. And whatever it was, it will be with me forever. Sleigh Bells Ring by J. R. Our eerie encounter in the Smoky Mountains started as a group camping trip aimed at exploring the natural beauty and rugged terrain of one of America's most beloved national parks. But what we experienced over those few nights has left each of us questioning the reality of the wilderness that surrounds us. Our group, five in total, set up camp in a secluded area surrounded by dense forests and a clear view of the starry sky. The first day was an adventure, filled with hiking and sightseeing and everything we had gone there for. As night fell, we gathered around the campfire, shared some stories, and were pretty much just enjoying the peaceful ambiance of the mountains. Then we started to hear a noise. We all kind of sat up and looked around, trying to figure out what it was. It was ringing, like the sound of small bells echoing throughout the forest. It was faint but distinct, encircling our campsite. It was kind of close to Christmas, and so we kind of joked about it, making up stories of Santa or forest fairies or lost hikers with jingle bells. But as the ringing continued, a sense of unease settled over us. Eventually, we shrugged it off as a quirk of the forest. Maybe somebody had weird wind chimes on a cabin somewhere, or maybe it was some kind of natural phenomenon. We figured we'd look it up when we got home and thought nothing of it. We went to bed, and even though it was kind of strange, the sound of the bells did sort of lull us to sleep. The next morning, we found something that turned the whole ordeal from something whimsical to something downright scary. Right in the middle of our campsite, there lay a single sleigh bell, old and slightly rusted. None of us had seen it before, none of us owned anything like it, and none of us could explain how it got there. The sight of it, so out of place this deep in the wilderness, was deeply unsettling. Every single night of our trip, the scenario repeated. The distant ringing of bells, always starting at nightfall and continuing until dawn. Every morning, we would find another singular sleigh bell in the middle of camp. We searched the area, thinking maybe somebody was playing a prank on us, but we never found another sign of a human presence anywhere. Our conversations about the bells became more serious and speculative. We discussed everything from pranksters to supernatural explanations, but none of it made sense. The Smoky Mountains are rich with folklore and legends, but none that we knew of mentioned mysterious bells. 
On our last night, the ringing was louder, more insistent. It felt like whatever was making the noise was getting closer and more intentional. We barely slept, the sound of bells consuming our thoughts. In the morning, we found not one, but several sleigh bells scattered around our tents, one for each of us to be exact. We packed up and left the mountains with more questions than we dared to admit, more questions than any of us really wanted answers to. We talked about reporting it, but what on earth would we say we were stalked by Santa? It sounded absurd even to us. Hey, we'd like to report sleigh bells in the woods and random bells in our campsite. I mean, come on. Ever since that trip, we've all stayed in touch. Occasionally, we bring up the bells and our theories. Some of us have tried to research similar occurrences, but so far we've come up empty-handed. So here we are, asking if anybody else has experienced this in the Smoky Mountains. The Forgotten Campsite It all started as a weekend camping trip with my two best friends, Alex and Jenna, in the remote woods of Oregon. We had planned this getaway for weeks, aiming for a spot known as the Forgotten Campsite, named so due to its seclusion and the tales that hikers occasionally stumbled upon it by chance. We set out early, our backpacks laden with the essentials, the excitement palpable among us. The hike to the campsite was challenging, but beautiful, taking us through dense forests and along a meandering river. By late afternoon, we found it, a small clearing with an old rusted fire ring at its center, the ground flattened by previous campers. We set up our tents and gathered wood for a fire. As night fell, we cooked dinner over the flames, sharing stories and laughter under the starlit sky. Everything was perfect, or so it seemed. Later, as we settled into our tents, a sense of unease crept over me. The forest, lively with sounds during the day, was eerily silent, as if all the nocturnal creatures had suddenly vanished. I tried to sleep, attributing my unease to the new surroundings. In the middle of the night, I was awakened by a faint whispering outside my tent. At first, I thought it was Alex or Jenna, but a quick glance showed them both asleep. I listened, heart racing, as the whispering grew louder, a chorus of indistinct voices that seemed to encircle our campsite. I nudged Alex awake and he heard it too. We cautiously unzipped the tent, half expecting to find somebody playing a prank, but the clearing was empty, the whispering voices now fading away into the night. The next morning, we discussed the event. Jenna, a very heavy sleeper, had heard nothing. Alex and I were perplexed, but decided that it might have been the wind or some nocturnal animal. As the day progressed, we tried to put the incident behind us, exploring the nearby woods and river. But the sense of unease lingered, a shadow over our previously cheerful spirits. That night, the whispering returned, more coherent this time. We could almost make out words, but not in any language that we recognized. This time, Jenna heard it too. Terrified, we huddled together in one tent, none of us daring to step outside. The next day, we decided to cut our trip short. As we hurriedly packed our gear, I noticed something strange. Small stone-like objects arranged in a circle around our campsite. They had not been there before. The arrangement was deliberate, almost ritualistic. We left the forgotten campsite with more questions than answers. Who had whispered in the night? What did the stone circle signify? Our search for answers in the following weeks turned up nothing. This camping trip, meant to be an escape from the mundane, which I suppose it was, turned into an ordeal that we still talk about to this very day.
The Melody of Crater Lake by Jordan L. My encounter during a camping trip near Crater Lake in Oregon still puzzles me. Crater Lake, known for its deep blue water and legends, seemed like the perfect spot for a solo camping adventure. I was looking for peace and quiet, but what I found was mystery. I set up camp in a secluded spot with a view of the lake. The first day was blissful. I hiked around the area, taking in the stunning scenery. As night fell, I sat by my campfire, the stars reflecting off the lake's surface, creating an almost otherworldly atmosphere. That's when I first heard it, a soft, haunting melody drifting across the lake. It sounded like a flute, but sweeter, more ethereal. I looked around, trying to find the source, but there was no one in sight. The music seemed to be coming from the lake itself. Intrigued and a bit unnerved, I decided to investigate. I walked along the shore, the melody growing louder, more compelling. It was as if the music was calling to me, pulling me toward a hidden secret of the lake. As I reached a clearing by the water's edge, the music suddenly stopped. The silence was abrupt, almost jarring. I stood there, confused, looking out over the calm waters. There was a ripple, as if something had just submerged, but other than that, nothing. I returned to my campsite, my mind racing with questions. I barely slept, the memory of the melody replaying in my mind. The next morning, I asked a park ranger about it. He smiled and said that others had reported hearing strange music around the lake, usually at night. Some believed it was the wind, others thought it was something more mystical, but nobody ever thought it was threatening, and neither did I. The rest of my trip was uneventful, but the melody lingered. On my last night, I heard it again. This time, I just listened, letting the mysterious music wash over me. It almost felt like a farewell, a closing serenade from the depths of Crater Lake. My camping trip there was over, and sadly I had to leave. And as unsettling and sometimes mysterious as I find the whole thing, I'm also really looking forward to going back. Like I said, it didn't strike me as being threatening, just odd. And who couldn't use a little touch of whimsy from time to time? The Night Visitor. My camping trip to Starlight Camp, a small, lesser known site nestled in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada, was supposed to be a weekend of relaxation. It turned out to be anything but. I arrived on a Friday afternoon, the campsite quiet with just a few other campers in the distance. I set up my tent in a cozy spot near a stream, looking forward to a weekend of fishing and reading. The first night was pretty peaceful, filled with the sounds of the forest and the gentle flow of the stream. I fell asleep quickly, tired from the drive and the setup. I woke up sometime around midnight, unsure why at first. The fire had died down to glowing embers and the forest was silent, a bit too silent. And that's when I noticed the silhouette outside of my tent. It looked like a person standing there motionless. Rubbing the sleep from my eyes, I called out, asking if they needed help. There was no answer. Against my better judgment, I unzipped the tent slowly, my heart pounding. But as I looked out, the figure was gone. I scanned the area with my flashlight, but there was no sign of anyone. I told myself it was probably just a trick of the shadows, or Maybe another camper wandering by, and I just thought they were standing there. All the stupid things you tell yourself when you're trying to convince yourself that you didn't see what you just saw. The next day was uneventful, filled with fishing and exploring the nearby trails. I met a few other campers, but none of them seemed to be out late the previous night. That night, I stayed up, curious to see if the silhouette would return. 
The hours ticked by, and just as I was about to give up and go to sleep, I saw it again. The same figure standing at the edge of the campsite. This time, I didn't hesitate. I grabbed my flashlight and stepped out of the tent. As I approached, the figure seemed to blur and shift, almost like a wisp of smoke caught in a gentle breeze. And then it just dissipated. I stood there, flashlight in hand, trying to make sense of it. There was nothing there, no tracks, no sign of anyone having been there at all. I didn't sleep much that night, my mind racing with questions. Was it a ghost, a trick of the light, my imagination? In the morning, I asked around, but again, none of the other campers had seen anything unusual or been out late. I left Starlight Camp with a mix of relief and curiosity. The experience of the night visitor was something I couldn't easily shake off. I suppose it wasn't threatening, but it was bizarre, an unexplained anomaly in an otherwise normal weekend, but it definitely left me more concerned than relaxed. I've thought about going back, maybe to try to see it again or to get some answers, but every time I think about it, I think better of it. The Shadow at Priest Lake My unsettling encounter during a camping trip in northern Idaho near Priest Lake remains a vivid memory. Priest Lake, with its crystal clear waters and dense forests, is a haven for campers and hikers. I went there with a group of friends for a weekend getaway, unaware of the eerie experience that awaited us. We set up camp in a remote area near the lake shore. The first day was perfect, kayaking, fishing, and exploring the surrounding wilderness. As the sun set, we gathered around the campfire sharing stories and enjoying the tranquil beauty of the lake. That night, after we had all settled into our tents, I was awakened by a strange noise outside. It sounded like whispers, but disjointed and inconsistent. Thinking it might be one of my friends, I stepped out of the tent. The campfire was out and the moon cast a pale light over the campsite. The whispers stopped abruptly and I noticed something moving at the edge of the forest. It was a shadowy figure just beyond the reach of the moonlight. It seemed to be watching us. I called out, thinking maybe somebody was lost and needed help, but the figure didn't respond. Instead, it slowly retreated into the trees. I woke up a couple of my friends, and we tried to find the figure with our flashlights, but it was gone. We were all a bit spooked, and nobody slept much that night. The next day, we asked around at other campsites and even talked to a park ranger, but no one else had seen anything unusual. We tried to brush it off, but the encounter had left us feeling uneasy. That night, the whispers returned, more coherent this time, as if someone, or something, was speaking in a language we couldn't understand. Again, the shadowy figure appeared at the edge of the forest, but this time it was closer. It was tall and thin, and it almost blended into the trees. We all put our flashlight beams on it, but the light seemed to just pass right through, as if the figure was made of smoke. As quickly as it showed up, it vanished, and we were left in stunned silence. We decided to leave in the morning, cutting our trip short. It was just too unsettling to ignore, and none of us could get any sleep anyway. We packed up our gear, still glancing around, a little bit nervous of the tree line. Since that trip, I've heard some stories from other campers I know about strange sightings near Priest Lake, tales of shadowy figures and unexplained whispers in the night. Some say it's just the wind or animals, but Others believe it's something a little bit more ominous. Whatever it was, we're never going back.
The Vanishing Camper. I've camped in many places, but nothing compares to the experience I had last summer in the deep woods. It was a secluded forest in the Pacific Northwest, known for its old growth trees and pristine lakes. This trip, which I embarked on alone, left me with an eerie story and a lingering sense of really not knowing what I encountered. I arrived at the woods on a sunny afternoon, found a spot near a small lake and set up camp. The first day passed peacefully, filled with hiking and enjoying the solitude. As night fell, I built a fire, cooked a simple meal and relaxed under the stars. That night, I was awoken by the sound of footsteps outside my tent. I assumed it was a deer or some other animal, so I ignored it and tried to get back to sleep. But then I heard a voice, a man's voice, calling out softly, Hello? Is someone there? Curious and a little bit concerned, I got out of my tent. A few yards away stood a man. He looked to be in his 40s, dressed in camping gear, and a bewildered look on his face. He told me that his name was Tom and that he had gotten lost while hiking. He asked if he could share my fire as his supplies were low. Cautiously, I agreed. We sat by the fire and Tom shared his story. He said he'd been hiking for days, unable to find his way back to any familiar trail. His story struck me as odd. How could someone survive that long being so lost? But I chalked it up to luck and a survival instinct and probably years of experience. The next morning, Tom was gone. His disappearance was as sudden as his arrival. No trace of him remained, not even footprints. It was as though he just vanished into thin air sometime during the night. A little weirded out by this, I decided to hike back to the ranger station. I mentioned Tom and described his appearance and situation. I thought the ranger might be concerned and jot down some notes, but instead he was shocked. He showed me a missing person poster. It was Tom, but the poster was old, dated five years ago. Tom had gone missing in these woods and had never been found. Chills ran down my spine as I looked at the poster. The man I had spoken to, the man who had shared my fire, was a missing person lost to these woods years ago. How could that be? Was it a ghost, a figment of my imagination, some overlap of reality or something else entirely? That encounter with Tom was something I just couldn't explain. And that experience has stayed with me forever. Amidst the crumbling remnants of ancient Greece, where history's echoes whispered through time, a haunting presence lingered, a gorgon named Medusa. Her dread-inducing visage, adorned with writhing snakes for hair, awaited those who dared to venture near, for her petrifying gaze could turn the bravest of souls into lifeless stone. My encounter with this terrifying legend left me with a chilling sense of the macabre. It was within the shadowed corridors of a Greek ruin, where the stones bore witness to the passage of centuries, that I came upon Medusa's lair. The legends of the Gorgon had always filled me with a sense of foreboding, and now, as I ventured deeper into the labyrinthine passageways, I could feel the weight of her dark tail pressing down upon me. The ancient stones seemed to groan beneath the weight of history as I pressed on, my footsteps echoing in the eerie silence. The air was thick with the scent of age and decay, and the very atmosphere seemed to tremble with an unnatural tension. And then I saw her, a monstrous figure, her face obscured by a veil of shadow, 
her hair writhing like serpents in the dim light. It was Medusa, the Gorgon of Greek mythology, a creature whose gaze could bring death by transformation. As I stood frozen in terror, I watched as she moved with a sinister grace, her serpentine hair hissing with a deadly intent. Her eyes, hidden behind a shroud of darkness, exuded a malevolence that chilled me to the bone. The legend spoke of Medusa's power to turn those who met her gaze into solid stone, their bodies forever frozen in a grotesque mockery of life. Her curse was said to be an abomination, a punishment for her beauty and the arrogance of men who sought to possess her. I dared not meet her eyes, for the consequences of such an encounter were too ghastly to contemplate. I could feel her presence, her malevolent aura, as she moved closer, her serpentine hair writhing with anticipation. With a shudder, I turned and fled from the ruins, my heart pounding in my chest. I knew that I had come face to face with a force that transcended human understanding, a creature of myth and legend whose power was both horrifying and undeniable. Autumn in Sleepy Hollow carries a distinct chill, a foreboding promise of what's to come. The leaves rustle underfoot, and the air grows crisp as the sun dips below the horizon. It was on such an evening that I found myself walking along the winding roads of this eerie town, shrouded in legends and whispered tales. The moon hung low, casting long shadows as I followed the path that led me to the bridge crossing the Pocantico River. It was there that I first heard the ominous sound of hooves approaching, distant but unmistakable. The night seemed to hold its breath as the echoes drew nearer, and I found myself transfixed. The creature of folklore, the headless horseman, was said to roam these very roads. I'd heard the stories, of course, but like any sensible person, I had dismissed them as mere tales spun to entertain and frighten. But as the thunderous hoofbeats grew louder, doubt gnawed at me. Suddenly, he emerged from the shadows, a monstrous silhouette atop a black steed. I could feel the ground tremble with each pounding step as the horseman drew closer. His form was indistinct, obscured by the inky blackness of the night. What struck terror into my very soul was the absence where a head should be. A fiery pumpkin perched upon his shoulders, its ghastly grin casting an eerie glow upon the surroundings. The sight of it, hovering in midair, seemed unnatural, like some unholy magic brought to life. In that brief moment, I understood the stories were no mere flights of fancy. I dared not move for fear of drawing the horseman's attention. The legend spoke of his penchant for seeking vengeance, and I had no intention of being the object of his ire. Instead, I stood there, rooted to the spot, my heart pounding in my chest as he thundered past me, the malevolent specter of Sleepy Hollow. The wind whistled through the trees as he galloped into the night, his fiery pumpkin casting an eerie glow that slowly faded into the distance. I watched until the last vestiges of the headless horseman disappeared, leaving behind an unsettling silence. I cannot explain what I witnessed that night, nor do I wish to. But this much I know, the legends of Sleepy Hollow are not to be taken lightly. The Headless Horseman is no mere tale to be dismissed. He is a presence that lingers in the shadows, a reminder that some mysteries are better left unsolved. And as I stood there in the moonlit darkness, I couldn't help but wonder if there were other creatures, equally as sinister, lurking in the obscure corners of this world. In Sleepy Hollow, the line between folklore and reality had blurred, leaving me with a chilling uncertainty that would haunt me for the rest of my days. Mm -hmm. 
The Slavic woods have always been a place of mystery and folklore. As a child, my grandmother would tell me tales of creatures and spirits that dwelled within its depths. But the one story that always sent shivers down my spine was that of Baba Yaga. One summer, driven by youthful curiosity and a touch of bravado, I decided to venture deep into the woods to see if the legends were true. I had heard whispers of a peculiar hut that stood on chicken legs, and I was determined to find it. After days of wandering, I stumbled upon a clearing. In its center stood a wooden hut, its architecture bizarre and unsettling. It stood on two massive chicken legs, and as I approached, the hut began to spin, its windows and doors shifting and changing places. Gathering my courage, I called out, Hut, hut, turn your back to the forest and your front to me. To my astonishment, the hut obeyed, setting down with its door facing me. I cautiously stepped inside and was met with an even stranger sight. The interior was filled with odd trinkets and herbs hanging from the ceiling, and there, in the center of the room, sat an old crone, her skin wrinkled and her teeth made of iron. It was Baba Yaga. She looked me up and down, her gaze sharp and calculating. What brings a young one like you to my abode? She cackled. Swallowing my fear, I replied, I wanted to see if the legends were true. Baba Yaga laughed, a sound that was both eerie and mesmerizing. You have spirit, she said. But be warned, not all who enter my hut leave unscathed. We spoke for what felt like hours. She told me tales of the forest, of its spirits and creatures, and of her own ancient powers. I listened, captivated by her stories and the world she painted. As dawn approached, Baba Yaga looked out of her window. It's time for you to leave, she said, her voice softer now. But remember, the woods are a place of magic and mystery. Respect them and they will respect you. I nodded, thanking her for her wisdom. As I stepped out of the hut, it began to spin once more. And when I looked back, it had vanished, leaving only the whispering trees behind. I returned to my village with a newfound respect for the legends of my people, Baba Yaga, the fearsome witch of the woods, had shown me a glimpse of a world beyond our understanding, a world where magic and reality intertwine. Algonquin Park in Ontario was a place of solace for me. As a child, my family would often visit and I would lose myself in the vastness of its woods. As an adult, I continued the tradition, often taking solo trips to reconnect with nature. But one autumn trip shifted my perspective forever. I had planned a five day hike, charting a course that would take me through some of the park's less traveled areas. The first couple of days were peaceful, filled with the vibrant colors of fall and the gentle sounds of the forest. On the third day, as I was making my way through a particularly dense section of woods, I began to hear it, a soft, rhythmic crunching of leaves. At first, I thought it was just the wind or perhaps a small animal, but as the hours went on, the sound persisted, always behind me always just out of sight. That evening, as I set up camp near a quiet stream, I caught a fleeting glimpse of something in the periphery of my vision. A large figure, covered in fur, moving swiftly between the trees. I tried to dismiss it as a trick of the light, or perhaps fatigue playing tricks on my mind. But as night fell, the sounds grew closer. The once gentle crunching of leaves now felt ominous echoing through the stillness of the night. I lay in my tent, flashlight in hand, listening intently. Every so often, I would hear a soft grunt or a low growl, sending shivers down my spine. 
In the early hours of the morning, curiosity overcame fear. I cautiously unzipped my tent and peered out. The moon was high in the sky, casting a silvery glow over the forest. And there, on the edge of the clearing, stood a massive creature, its fur glistening in the moonlight. It looked at me with curious eyes, its gaze neither threatening nor friendly, just observing. We locked eyes for what felt like an eternity, and then, with a grace that belied its size, it turned and disappeared into the woods. The next day I found large footprints near my campsite, confirming that my encounter had been real. I decided to cut my trip short, feeling both awed and unnerved by what I had witnessed. As I made my way back to the park's entrance, I crossed paths with an elder from a local tribe. I shared my experience, and he listened intently. He spoke of the Sasquatch, a guardian of the woods, a creature that his people had known of for generations. He told me I was fortunate that such encounters were rare and were often seen as a sign, a reminder that we are but guests in these ancient woods, and there are beings far older and more mysterious than us that call it home. I left Algonquin Park with a newfound respect for its mysteries. The vast forests, with their towering trees and hidden trails, were more than just a place of beauty. They were a realm where legends walked, always one step ahead, always watching. The pale morning sun filtered through the tall pines as I laced up my hiking boots and prepared for a day on the trails. I had backpacked deep into the Cascades to get away from the noise and stress of everyday life. Out here, I could be fully immersed in nature. Slipping on my pack, I consulted my map and set off down the trail. I hiked for several miles, the only sounds being the wind rustling leaves, and my boots crunching on the forest floor. At a clearing, I stopped to sip some water and take in the view. Snow-capped peaks jutted up in the distance. All was tranquil. After stowing my water bottle, I stood and stretched my legs. Just then, a loud crack reverberated through the trees ahead. I froze. Another crack boomed accompanied by heavy bipedal footsteps. Adrenaline coursed through my veins. Gripping my walking stick, I called out nervously, Hello? The footsteps grew louder, branches snapping like gunshots. This was no bear or deer. It sounded like a person. But how? I was miles from civilization. Fear and fascination dueled within me. I wanted to flee, but my legs were paralyzed. The footsteps thudded closer, and suddenly, a massive creature stepped out from the pines. My heart nearly stopped. Standing before me was a huge, hair-covered beast, walking upright on two legs. It stood at least eight feet tall, with broad shoulders and muscular limbs. The face was obscured by a mane of reddish-brown hair, except for two dark, intelligent eyes gazing back at me. We stared at each other, neither of us moving a muscle. My mind reeled, unable to accept what I was seeing. Bigfoot. It couldn't be real, and yet here it was. The biggest discovery in natural history living and breathing. Slowly, Bigfoot leaned forward, eyes piercing into me with uncanny awareness. It was analyzing me as I tried fruitlessly to analyze it. I was in awe, overwhelmed by this mythical beast made real. Then, calmly, it turned and sauntered back into the ancient forest. I watched, dumbstruck, until it disappeared like a ghost. I hurried down the trail, 
hands shaking. I knew my claims would be ridiculed and dismissed, but I didn't need validation. My reality had been irrevocably shifted. I had witnessed something beyond explanation, a glimpse into the unknown. Somewhere out there, Bigfoot still dwells, a humbling reminder that nature still holds secrets beyond our grasp. I will forever cherish the brief wonder of our encounter. The old clock on the barn wall clanged midnight, just as I hauled the last musty bale up into the hayloft. I paused to wipe beads of sweat off my brow and take a deep, satisfying breath. The worn wooden walls creaked gently in the night breeze, mingling with the faint moos of Bessie settling down for bed. Outside, the farm was swallowed by inky darkness, not even starlight pierced through the blanket of clouds tonight. After latching the heavy barn doors, I headed back home, anxious to put my feet up. But a prickle shivered up my spine before I'd gone even 20 paces. Something in the air felt off. The hairs on my neck stood at attention. The farm was as silent as a graveyard, not even the whisper of the wind through the cornfields. I froze in my tracks at the sound of panicked bleeding near the pasture. Old Margaret, the sheep, crying for help. I grabbed my flashlight and sprinted over, sweeping the feeble light across the field. It glinted off glassy eyes and tousled wool as the sheep bumped each other in distress. There, the light fixed on a horror hovered over Margaret's limp body. My heart seized at the sight of its emaciated frame, nothing but leathery hide clinging to jagged bones, coarse fur sprouting in mangy patches across its haggard body. But most terrifying was the row of spikes jutting from its arched, snarling back. The creature's head snapped toward me, glowing crimson eyes meeting mine. Blood dripped from jagged fangs bared in a gruesome sneer. Every childhood nightmare about the chupacabra sprang to life before my eyes. I stumbled back as it unleashed an ungodly screech that rattled my bones. Those hellish eyes bored into mine a moment more, and then the beast disappeared like a wisp of smoke into the darkness between heartbeats. I ran to Margaret, but it was too late. Her wool was matted with blood where the chupacabra had fed. Childhood myths warped into flesh and blood before my eyes, into razor fangs that had claimed another innocent life under the cloak of night. The ancient ruins of Delphi perched high on the slopes of Mount Parnassus have long been a place of pilgrimage and wonder. Known as the center of the world in ancient Greek religion, it was said to be protected not just by the gods, but by creatures of majestic power, the griffins. I had always been fascinated by Greek mythology and the tales of these magnificent beings with the body of a lion and the head and wings of an eagle. They were among my favorite stories. So when an opportunity arose to join an archeological expedition to Delphi, I leapt at the chance. Our team was searching for remnants of ancient rituals and artifacts. Days turned into weeks, and while we uncovered many fascinating relics, there was no sign of the griffins. That was until one evening, as the sun cast a golden hue over the ruins. I had wandered away from the main excavation site and found myself in a secluded grove. In its center stood a stone pedestal and atop it, a gleaming golden object. As I approached, I realized it was a beautifully crafted beak, sharp and gleaming like a sword. 
Suddenly, a shadow passed overhead. I looked up to see two massive griffins, their golden beaks matching the one on the pedestal, circling above. Their eyes, fierce and proud, locked on to mine, and for a moment, I felt the weight of their scrutiny, as if they were assessing my very soul. With a powerful flap of their wings, they descended, landing gracefully on either side of the pedestal. They regarded me with a mix of curiosity and caution, their majestic presence filling the grove. I slowly approached the pedestal, placing my hand on the golden beak. A rush of images flooded my mind, rituals, ceremonies, and the griffins standing guard, protecting the sacred site and its treasures from invaders. As the vision faded, I found myself back in the grove, the griffins still watching me. With a nod of their heads, as if acknowledging a shared understanding, they spread their wings and soared into the sky, disappearing into the setting sun. I returned to the camp, the golden beak in hand, and shared my encounter with the team. While many were skeptical, our lead archaeologist, well versed in the myths, believed. He spoke of the griffins as guardians, protectors of the divine and the sacred. The discovery of the beak was hailed as a significant find, a tangible link to the legends of old. But for me, it was more than just an artifact. It was a reminder of the magic and mystery that still dwells in our world, guarded by beings of ancient power and majesty. The North Sea was known for its treacherous waters and unpredictable weather, but for us sailors, it was also a source of livelihood. Our ship was a sturdy vessel that had seen many voyages, but nothing could have prepared us for that day. The morning started off calm, the sea reflecting the pale blue of the sky. We were making good time, the wind filling our sails as we navigated through familiar waters. But as the day wore on, a sense of unease settled over the crew. The waters grew darker, and the air became thick with tension. Whispers among the crew spoke of ancient legends, tales of a monstrous creature that lurked in the depths, waiting for its next victim. I dismissed these as mere superstitions, but I couldn't shake off the feeling that we were being watched. As evening approached, the waters began to churn. Massive waves rocked our ship, and a deep rumbling echoed from the depths below. And then, without warning, they appeared. Massive tentacles, each one the size of a ship's mast, rose from the water, reaching for the sky. The crew was thrown into chaos. Men shouted orders, trying to navigate away from the looming threat. But it was too late. The tentacles wrapped around our ship, pulling it closer to the abyss. The wood creaked and groaned under the immense pressure, and I could hear the terrified screams of my crewmates. I clung to the mast, my eyes fixed on the monstrous appendages that threatened to pull us under. And then, from the depths, it emerged. A colossal eye, black and unblinking, stared at us its gaze filled with ancient malice. The world seemed to stand still in that moment. Time lost all meaning as we were held in the Kraken's grasp. And then, as suddenly as it had appeared, the creature released us, the tentacles retracted into the depths, and the sea calmed once more. We were left adrift, our ship damaged but still afloat. The crew was shaken, many injured, but miraculously, everybody was alive. For some reason, we had faced the Kraken and lived to tell the tale. The rest of our journey was a blur. We made our way back to port, our ship a testament to our harrowing encounter. Many dismissed our tales as the rambling of traumatized sailors, but we knew the truth. The North Sea still calls to us, its waters filled with promise and peril. 
but we sail with caution, always aware of the ancient terror that lurks below, waiting for its next prey. I had dreamed of this moment ever since I was a child. The chance to finally see the legendary Loch Ness monster with my own eyes. And now, here I stood on the pebbled shores of the iconic Loch Ness, wrapped in an early morning mist that curled off the glassy water. I had risen hours before dawn, too anxious and excited to sleep through the night before my long-awaited quest. As the first rays of sun peeked over the rolling green hills, I scanned the expansive lock with abated breath. A quiet stillness hung in the air, interrupted only by the occasional lap of water against the rocks. And then, suddenly, a great rush of movement. A flock of birds erupted from the trees, squawking in panic. My pulse quickened, and I stared intently at the spot where they had taken flight, had something disturbed them below the surface? Churning water appeared, too forceful to be caused by any ordinary fish or eel. My heart pounded as the massive shape of some underwater creature twisted just below the water's surface. Its immense serpentine body undulated with surprising grace given its enormous size. I could scarcely believe my eyes overwhelmed by the ancient beast of legend and lore coming to life before me. Slowly, carefully, the creature turned toward the shore where I stood, immobilized in awe. As it approached, its details came into focus, a long arched neck extending from its body, the head small and rounded compared to its girth. Sunlight glittered off dark scales in hues of green and steel gray. Though terrified, I also felt profound privilege to encounter this mythic animal in the flesh. The massive head rose from the water, beady eyes locking onto mine briefly, as if taking stock of who had intruded upon its ancient realm. I dared not move a muscle, feeling as though I was glimpsing a piece of the past a creature that time had forgotten. With a powerful flick of its muscular tail, the monster slowly submerged again into the loch's shadowy depths. I lingered long after it had gone, overwhelmed and hoping to catch one last look. Though the beast did not resurface, I knew that I would treasure that magical moment on the shore forever. The Loch Ness monster was real, and I felt honored to have seen it if only for a moment. The Rocky Mountains are a hiker's paradise, a sprawling tapestry of craggy peaks and emerald forests. On that particular day, the trails were mine alone. There's something intoxicating about solitude in the wilderness, the silence punctuated only by nature's murmurs. But solitude can turn isolating when the sun dips low and the mountain's shadows grow long. I'd ventured farther than planned, lured by the promise of unmarked paths and virgin territory. The sun was on its descent, casting a golden glow on the landscape when I stumbled upon it, a cabin hidden away like a forgotten memory. Dilapidated, its wooden planks weathered by time, it stood in jarring contrast to the surrounding beauty. Curiosity tugged at me. Logic argued against it. Old structures can be dangerous and darkness was closing in. But curiosity won, as it often does. I approached, pushing the door open, which protested with a groan. Stepping inside was like stepping into another era. Dust floated in the rays of the dying sunlight filtering through broken windows. Old furniture, draped in decaying fabric, filled the space. 
Then my eyes fell on the hearth, where a collection of photographs lay, scattered, as if left in haste. I picked one up, squinting in the dim light. A family, smiling, their clothes outdated but their happiness timeless. It was a moment captured, but the moment had long since passed. That's when I felt it, a chill, an icy finger running down my spine. The room seemed to darken, as if a cloud had passed over the sun, but there was more to it. A heaviness filled the air, an oppressive energy that bore down on me. Something was wrong. I knew it, felt it deep in my bones. I set the photograph down, my hand trembling ever so slightly. My mind screamed at me to leave, to flee this place and the palpable dread that clung to it. But just as I turned, a sound froze me in my tracks. A child's laughter, echoing as if from within the walls themselves. The cabin had no other rooms, no hidden corners where somebody could hide. I was alone, yet not alone. The laughter came again, followed by a whisper so faint I could barely make out the words. Stay with us. It was a plea, tinged with sorrow, and for a moment my heart ached for the voices behind it. But then the room grew colder, the weight in the air turning from oppressive to threatening. I realized then that the plea was also a warning, the last remnants of a tragedy long past but never forgotten. This was a haunted place, its spectral occupants clinging to it, just as it clung to them. I bolted, pushing through the door with a force born of pure adrenaline. I didn't stop, I didn't dare look back, until the cabin was out of sight, swallowed by the trees and the encroaching darkness. Only when I hit the marked trail did I slow, my lungs burning, my mind struggling to process what I had experienced. I made it back to my car as the last light of day vanished, leaving in its wake a night as dark as the history I'd brushed up against. I drove away, leaving the cabin in the depths of the mountain, its story untold, but its presence unforgettable. And though I've returned to those mountains many times since, to conquer new trails and seek new adventures, I have never found that cabin again. I've come to believe it's not a place one finds intentionally, but rather a place that reveals itself when it wants to be found. A chilling remnant of a world best left undisturbed.